Mr. Jack Pransky. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, the man of the hour. I love the chair you're sitting in. It, uh, <laughs> it, it, it looks like a guru chair. I like it. It looks like you're, you're about to talk business. <laughs> now that you said that, I'll probably never be able to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good morning. Thank you so much for doing this again. My pleasure. Hi, everybody out there. Yeah, okay. What? <laughs> we'll wait a couple more minutes while we're waiting. I'm just going to do a, a short little intro. I'm not going to do an intro like, oh, Jack Pransky has been. I just want to let you let people here know uh, how long I've been following him secretly. He probably doesn't even know. But these were the – I used to go – when I used to travel a lot, I'd go to like a – with my group of friends, like I'd go to a bachelor party. And while I was there and on the plane, I would be reading these kind of books. And they're like, what is wrong with you? We're about to go party. And these are some pretty heavy, thick books on – Prevention from the Inside Out by Jack Pransky. Uh, healthy, healthy thinking, feeling, doing from the inside out. This is a middle school curriculum for teaching the inside out. All of these. Parenting. I was reading this before I even had kids. I mean, the, so I just want to let you, you guys know that Jack has had a tremendous influence on me. Um, and this was before I even talked to him. So when I got, got on the phone with him, I was able to actually speak to him in person. It was like I was talking to a celebrity. So... I would have to say I got into my thinking when I talked to him the first time, but uh, he put me at ease. The guy's just an incredible person, just the biggest heart I've ever met. And uh, when, when I ask him, hey, would you mind uh, you know, getting on a call with my group? He, never, he just says, w tell me some dates and I'll do it. And so here, we're here again. And Jack, I can't thank you enough for you always stepping up, always wanting to continue to help us see something that we haven't seen. And uh, and letting, letting, letting us get a, a really good idea as far as what the spirit of the principles are from what you've seen. So thank you so much for getting on this call. Well, it's my pleasure, Amir. And I just, at this point of my life, I just <laughs> want to be able to do whatever I can to help. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I want to get right to it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for a little bit with him. I want him to do most of the talking. And at the end of this Zoom call... Uh, we're going to take Q and A's, uh, but I, I want you guys to get a gist of where we want to go. And I think for me, and this is a little bit selfish, I've been getting a little bit lost in, in the community. There's so many, it seems like different branches that are, that are going out. There is the, the single paradigm branch, the, the people that are starting to get into the non-duality of, it seems like in, in, in in calling it the principles and some of the stuff has been really useful for me, but I'm, I'm starting to get lost. What I liked about you was its simplicity. It was almost like I was speaking to you when I would read your stuff and something about that resonated with me. And so I want to ask you, what's the direction that you see for everyone here that would be the most absolute, most useful thing that they can, the direction they should start looking at from your opinion that would be the most useful thing in regards to the principles. Is that a trick question, Amir? No, absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's a question that I actually want to answer just because I've been kind of fumbling with this lately. Well, the reason I actually uh, made that crack is because everybody has to see it the way that they see it. And so I can say, you know, I think, I think it, is best seen a certain way, but um, that might be not the same for everybody else. However, I will say, when Sid always talked about the three principles are simplicity itself, we all then made it complicated and because of that, it's been very easy for it to get skewed. And it used to be, I would say, that pretty much the Three Principles community, which was really small back in the old days, would pretty much all um, rise in their level of consciousness together or fall in their level of consciousness together. I mean, it was pretty much that people were on the same page. Over the last 
10 years or so, when things have started to absolutely, you know, skyrocket, like it was almost flatlined for a long time, and then just maybe inching up a little tiny bit at a time, and then all of a sudden, about 10 years ago, it starts to really go up. And that's a beautiful thing in a lot of ways, but it also has a, um, I hate to, word, hate to use the word danger, but since I can't think of another word, I'll use it. Danger to it in that you, you, people just are taking it in their own directions, which is great, but are they taking it in a direction that uh, truly adheres to the, the true meaning of the three principles? And that's the question I think everybody needs to ask for themselves. So when you're saying adhering to the three principles, what, what does that mean for you? In what Are respect? You personally? Me personally. Sure, absolutely, personally. For me personally, um, the three principles mean basically two things, probably only two things. They mean that, they mean creation of illusion, that we use our power of thought to create illusions that we think, that we see as reality, out of which we then think, feel, and act. And that's what we're doing every moment of every day. Secondly, it means that when that thinking shuts down, what's left? What's left is the pure essence of who we are as human beings, the pure spiritual essence that everyone has in their hearts. And we can only have the illusion that we are um, separate from it. And the way that we have the illusion that we're separate from it is by the way that we use our power of thought combining with consciousness inadvertently against ourselves. So to me, that is the simplicity right there. And people can talk about duality and non-duality and talk about uh, the single paradigm and all that kind of stuff, but to me, it just comes down to those two things. And I, to be honest with you, I, I, I agree. I know that's your, your, you're saying it was your personal view, but it sounds like a very universal view from what I've experienced. Um, one of the questions I got at my recovery center uh, when discussing the three principles, um, I got somebody that said, well, I get all this. I get it. Okay, so it's mind, consciousness, and thought. We use the um, capacity of thought to give us or, or you know thought and the capacity of consciousness to give us rise of our of our experience but so what so what now what do i do with it is kind of the the, the question that i received um, i had a lot of amazing explanations in my recovery group as to why it helped them but if you're sitting in the room and someone someone asked you that what, what would your response be well first of all i love that question i think that's the greatest question it's a question everybody needs to ask themselves. And, you know, some people get freaked out when, when they get asked a question like that. But, but really, it's a beautiful question because, because if that question can't be answered, then what are we talking about here? It, there, there has to be a so what behind it. So for example, um, in Seduced by Consciousness, I talked about um, when I visited uh, a woman who was working in a prison and teaching the three principles in the prison. And I realized every single one of those guys in there, every single one of them without fail, they saw a particular reality 
and they acted on that reality. That's why they're there. It's not like they said to themselves, oh, I've got the urge to rob a house. See, see, it's a compelling urge to rob a house. I've never had that myself, but it's a compelling urge, or it's a compelling urge to pick up a drink, or it's a compelling urge to do a drug, or it's a compelling urge to um, eat in a certain way, or not eat. You know, and so there are all these compelling urges and they look and they feel so real. They don't have any idea that it has anything to do with their own creation, their own creation of illusion. They see it as reality with a capital R. And as long as they see it that way, they are going after it. And that's the same exact thing for the rest of us. There's no difference between them and us, except maybe they have, um, well, number one, they were caught. And number two, maybe they did things that are a little more extreme than most of the rest of us would do. But really, in terms of their functioning and our functioning, it's exactly the same. We see reality that we end up feeling, a, you know, having a compelling feeling to act out of or, or speak out of or feel out of. And that becomes what is our life at that time. Even if we just get a little glimpse, I wonder if this has something to do with my thinking. Even that little tiny statement makes a space in between reality and us. So there's a little space in there. There's a little question mark. Wait a minute. Is this really reality? Or is this just something I have inadvertently made up that I'm going after? That so what is huge. Absolutely huge. It can make the difference between someone landing in jail or becoming addicted to drugs and alcohol or not. That's how so what it is. You know, and then, and then there's the part about, whoa, if we, if we weren't thinking any of those things, and we're just um, aligned with our own spiritual essence, we would not be committing those acts that we want to prevent and, and intervene with and treat. So if people don't realize this beautiful inner uh, part of themselves that is there to guide us well through life, and, the, and if people don't realize that they already have everything they need deep inside them, they're not going to then feel like they have to look to the outside world for their happiness. But we all do sometimes. Yeah, that was beautiful, um, Jack. And this goes along the lines with uh, one of our group members that mentioned that are people magnetically attracted to abusive? Um, you know, what is it that attracts if someone grew up in an abusive family or a household? Um, why does it seem then that they attract an abusive husband or an abusive wife or a, a relationship? And um, does what you just said correlate to, to, is there any, any correlation to, to someone that may continue an abusive relationship or why would they do that? Well, it's such a beautiful question. I, I saw that question and I was uh, about to answer it when I figured I could answer it on this. So, <laughs> um, it's so innocent. You know, it really is so innocent. If we are not only abused, we pick up things 
from the way, from what our parents say to us, said to us, from how we were treated. But it's not that we pick up those things directly. We pick up an interpretation of those things through our own thinking that we then take on as our own. And we don't necessarily know that we're taking that stuff on as their own. So we might take on abuse is all that I knew. I deserve to be abused. Or we might take on I'm worthless, so it doesn't matter anyway. So we might pick up that thought innocently as a kid. And then we go through life and we start applying it to the rest of things in life, but not consciously. You know, we're doing it. This is thinking behind the scenes, thinking that's hidden from us, thinking that is acting on us. And so someone gets into a relationship and that person is starting to show some signs of being abusive. Well, that feels really familiar. That feels real in, in, a, in a weird kind of way. It feels comforting. It's what the person knows. And it's almost like, of course, they're going to gravitate to what feels known and comfortable. Now, here's the thing about it, though. Because I know a lot of people who, um, you know, get into difficult relationships over and over again and I always ask them did you hear something at the very beginning that that said to you very quietly not a good idea to go there or watch out or red flag or something like that that is wisdom speaking and what, but, but it speaks with a very soft voice. It's very solid, it's very um, sure, but it speaks with a very soft voice. And the other kind of thinking just absolutely drowns it out. So people hear that thought, they hear that thought of wisdom, and it's very easy to turn away from because it just gets drowned out. Jack, I will attest to what you just said. Every single person that has gone to my recovery center that I've spoken to said there was that voice. There's not one person that has not come in and said, well, I never heard that. They literally said, had I just listened to myself before I did X, Y, and Z, I wouldn't be here. If I just took a moment, there's, there's a space that said, don't go in there or don't do this. And, I, and then they beat themselves up for not listening to that voice. Right. And so then that becomes an, an issue in of itself. They feel guilty for not listening to that wisdom. Uh, that recently happened to me in my, in my group. And they said, you know, what if that's just thought too, that I have to beat myself up over, over not listening to my wisdom? What if that's something that I can surpass as well? And it was beautiful because they, they got to see that. How powerful is that? Just to see that, wow, that's thought too. <laughs> you know, so, so normally, I would just go and beat myself up. But now, what if that's thought? I was talking to a guy um, just yesterday, who, um, or the day before, actually, who... Um, saw this new um, medical information that's coming out on the dangers of, of like long-term use of aspirin, especially for older people. So this is just new research that's come out very recently. Um, this fellow had a, um, uh, he, he had contracted, um, uh, bowel cancer or something, which he inherited from his uh, mother or runs in the family or something like that. And 
he knew that um, if he took a, a, a high dose of aspirin regularly, it would cut down his chances of relapsing, you know, getting bowel cancer back um, from, from a, like, it would go from an 80% chance to a 20%. So he started panicking. Oh my God, you know, what am I gonna do now? Am I going to, you know, give up this thing that is gonna give me, like cut down my chances from 80% to 20% of getting it back? And he was like in a, in a panic about it. It's a very, very interesting thing that I think, it talk about simplicity that a lot of us miss in terms of the three principles. There's stuff that happens in the outside world. Things happen. And then there's thought about it. And the, the best thing that we can do is know that those two things are separate. There's nothing we can do about aspirin having a certain effect on our bodies. There's nothing that we can do about having bowel cancer or a proclivity to it. There's nothing we can do, like this morning, I go running on the beach here, I come, come back, I'm, I'm hearing chainsawing going on, I come back to get my bike, and this road crew is cutting down branches of a tree right where my bike is. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, my bike is under there. And they, at first they were telling me, you have to go around, you can't go through there. I said, my bike is there. All these tree branches had crashed down upon my bicycle when they were cutting these trees. And so, you know, they had to like grab all these tree branches and, you know, take them away and take them away. And there's my bicycle like hanging on by the skin of its teeth. Now that is in the outside world. So at first, I got a thought of, you know, and then somewhere along the way, I thought, oh, well, that's just the way things go sometimes. Now, which one of those two things is real? And not only that, I get to live with whichever one I, I'm I'm. I pick for myself, not, not on purpose. So I want to go back then. I think this will be useful for everybody. Um, someone that is in an abusive relationship and going back or someone that has a day like you and they come to you for, for advice. They know who you are and they say, look, I've been in an abusive relationship. I've been like this for the last 10 years. My parents have treated me this way. Dave, uh, Dave's iPhone, if you can turn off your, uh, if you can mute your, Dave's iPhone, if you can mute, uh, I would appreciate it. I'm trying to find you, but I can't mute you. All right, well, let me see. Let me, let me try to find him real quick. I'm glad that's you, Amir, and not me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where is it? Uh, I can't find him. Oh, well. Well, Dave, if you're on here, uh, I'm glad you're here, but uh, turn off your phone. Thank you. Okay, well, while we're waiting for that, um, somebody that comes in with, with, with a relationship like that or is in a relationship like that, I know you, you re uh, wrote about that in... Uh, some, I think someone should have told us, uh, where do you begin with someone, someone like that? How do you start a conversation? What, what, and, I'll, and why I'm asking this, every time I ask you a question, 
it seems like you meet me exactly where I'm at with the question. You don't go, well, that's not a good question, or you should look at it this way. You say, that's an incredible question. That's, the, that's a question that everyone should answer, and something about that even puts me at ease. It's almost like I get validation for, for, for the question I asked, and then you kind of join me into to exploring the question. You have that gift, but for some of us that may not have the gift, what, what would be some something for, for you to share in, in regards to maybe starting a conversation specifically with someone that's in an abusive relationship. Let's just use that for an example. Well, the first thing that strikes me is I never try to give advice. Fair enough. <laughs> um, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. First, I have to be in a state of health myself. I, I could be brought down by their abusive situation. That would not be helpful. Um, I want to be able to maintain my bearings. I want to be able to stay in my health no matter what is going on. So that's the first thing. It has nothing to do with them right now. It just has to do with me. Secondly, I know they are coming into talking with me with a lot on their mind. I want to help their, the grip that they're thinking has on them to loosen because I know they're not gonna be able to hear anything new with the thinking that they're bringing into the session. So my job, job one, is to help them relax, help their minds relax in whatever way that I know how to do it. Build rapport, like rapport is job number one. Because I don't wanna open my mouth unless they are in a position to listen. The third thing is I really want to deeply, deeply listen to them. I want to just, um, you know, it's, it's a sacred thing to be sitting with another human being. They're entrusting you with you know, there's these really tough things that they're dealing with in life. It's incredible. The, the mere fact that they are bringing it up is, um, a, they are showing strength by doing that. Um, I want to be an empty vessel and just be with them in love and take them in and as an empty vessel, not have anything on my mind about anything. And just take them in, throw out questions, throw out comments, see if anything's going to take hold. Because I don't know where I'm going. I really don't know where I'm going with them. I'll listen, throw things out, ask questions, listen, listen, listen not know, not know, not know, until boom, something strikes me. That's when I will hopefully get permission from them to talk to them about what I see. Because I want them to be all ears. So I'm answering you in a, in a much more general way than I think you wanted an answer. But, uh, you know, I would have to actually be talking to somebody to know where I wanted to go with them. Jack, I, to be honest with you, I think that was precisely what I was, what I was not what I was looking for, what, what, what confirmed for me. The, what the gist of what I got for, from what you just said is you're there with them what you're doing next is the next true thing for you, which is, I don't know, I don't know, and maybe I'll know in a little bit, which, which means you're not, 
you're not living a conceptual life with that person or conceptual, like, well, I'm going to come up with three strategies before I've even spoken to them to see if something sticks. You literally said, I come in empty and I don't know. And hopefully something sticks to me. I think that's a very honest way to show up to a conversation, which to me has been significantly helpful in my recovery center. When someone asks me a question, I'm actually genuinely okay to say, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Wow. That, that's a tough one for me. If I was in your shoes, man, I don't know what I would do either. And I actually got that kind of truthfulness from, from reading your stuff. And it, that alone does something for people. The fact that you show up and you say, I don't know, let's explore together. I, I have no idea where to start. Let's, let's start looking at a direction and see what we find, hopefully find something in the next hour. What you just said is, is the essence of, I, sh I think, the exploration of the principles. So no, I think, I think it was absolutely beautiful. And truth be told, I'm not, I don't even have the thought, I hope I come up with something. Yeah. Because I think that thought inadvertently blocks listening. Because it's not my responsibility to come up with something. Because no matter what I come up with, the only thing that counts is their own insight. That's it. I could say the most brilliant things. And if they don't have an insight about it themselves, it won't amount to a hill of beans. Just doesn't matter. So I don't, I can't take responsibility for somebody else's um, healing, you could say. It's up to them. Now, I'll do everything in my power to help, help them get there. But it's like George, George uh, Pransky used to say, uh, you know, you can get somebody to the bus stop, but you can't make them get on the bus. You know, and, and, and uh, it's like, we can help by, by going through that, that so-called process that I laid out. That gets people to the bus stop. You know, it's easier for people to have an insight in that kind of a, a atmosphere, you could say, than not being in that atmosphere. But even that's not a guarantee. So for those listening, I guess what you can say, you have a lot less to do than we think as, as practitioners or someone that's trying to help. Um, because for, for many years, I thought it was on me. I was an NLP practitioner. I was a hypnotherapist. So they came in and I had a list of tricks. You know, I had to do my song and dance because it was on me. And this is like revolutionary. If you think about it, it's the opposite. It's not that it's not on you. It's that they have everything. So it's just a matter of when they see it. And, yeah. and you're just, just there along for the ride, in a That's sense. Absolutely true. That's beautiful. And a lot of people think, you know, a lot of people have the thought, they're paying me, I better come up with something. You know, and, and that is a killer thought. Because as soon as, as we um, have a thought like that, then we are off of listening. We're just thinking about ourselves. Our ego kicks in. We're listening to our ego. I better come up with something. It's on me. That blocks the pure energy of listening. So I, I will also say, if I'm not getting, if I'm not getting anywhere with somebody, I never think that the problem is with them. I think the problem is with my own listening. It just means I'm not listening deeply enough. I have to try some more. The trying is, is like the, the opposite word that I want to use there, but I have to go at it again Yeah, in a different way. To be honest with you, we have, we have about half an hour left. We could end it here and I can watch this 10 times. And this, this has been absolutely incredibly useful. And this is my confirmation of your, the, the, the wisdom and simplicity that I've missed 
for a very long time is like to get back to that and to listen to you. And I, I'm sure when I see some people raising their hands and are agreeing, it just, for me, it, like when, when George Pransky said, or when the, the saying, all boats rise with the tide, I, I literally feel like we all, all rising uh, with just you speaking right now. So thank you. And I, I do want to spend a little bit of time. If anyone has any questions uh, for Jack, are you open to some questions now? Sure. Are you okay with that? Anything, if anyone wants to say something, uh, even a, even a, an insight that occurred, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I'm sure Jack would be too. But if there's anyone on the call that wants to ask Jack a question, this is your chance. How do you want them to do that? I mean, you're just like... So you can just unmute yourself and uh, we can take it from there. Okay. Wendy. Wendy has a question. Great. Hey, Wendy. Hey. Hi, Jack. You and I met in Newton a couple months back. How are you? Yeah, great. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, you know, the, one of the last things, I, I agree with Amir, we, we could hang it up and go home now and meditate on this for a long time. But um, the, at the very end, when you said, um, if I'm asking myself, gee, I sure hope I come up with something because they're paying me for this. I understand that end of it. My dilemma has been all along in being in the coaching world is to say, it's worth it for you to engage me with my time, your money, so that, so that we can have a productive conversation. So how do you position that up front? So maybe I'm getting too crass too soon, but I want to be an, in te have integrity all the way through the process. I want to be a person that seems like a lovely, a lovely place to land. I want somebody to feel like they're heard deeply and they're cared about because I do do that. But if I want to migrate from my 40 hours spent selling widgets, which I do, to doing this, how does one position that? I hope that's clear. Yeah, I mean, if you bring the best of yourself to a session. And the best of yourself means your inner um, health and wisdom, your spiritual essence, and you are seeing that in them, no matter what their presenting behavior. And you are sitting with them in a feeling of love and listening. They're going to think it's worthwhile whether they have insights or not. It's just going to feel good to be in your presence. That's going to be good enough for them. Mm. Mm. It just feels good. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. That's helpful. So it, it's almost, it's not quite wordless, but it's not as wordful and uh, full of um, whatever. A lot of dialogue about times and prices and whatever as I might worry about because I'm not good at that I don't like that um, but I also like I said wouldn't mind um, migrating from a paycheck by an employer to taking care of myself doing something that I love it's so tricky Wendy it's so tricky because yes of course that would be a beautiful thing and you want to be able to do that but at the same time you know the the, the idea of because there's almost an uh-oh thought attached to it. You know, like, if I don't get it together, then I'm going to be stuck doing this other thing, or uh-oh, am I going to be able to, uh, um, you know, like, attract people to me enough so that I can make a full living this way? And right. Yeah. You know, and those are fear thoughts. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and the fear and ego thoughts combined. And those are never helpful. And so if you just see them for what they are, mm. then they will stop having a grip. Because it's not that that's going to end up attracting people anyway. Totally. You start being with people that way that we were talking about, the word gets out. The word gets out. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, real quick, I wanted to share a quick story along the lines of what you said, Jack. I, I used to do a big song and dance at my recovery because I don't have a recovery background. 
And uh, so when they offered me the, the position, you know, I thought my job was to teach a mind consciousness and thought and do all these quotes and show like videos and everything. And as I got better or more grounded in this understanding, I, I asked the group members, what's the most useful thing? And I was thinking they're going to tell me, oh, I know how thought works. I know what mind is now and all that. And they didn't. You know what their answer was to me? This is the only hour that I don't have to be an addict. I can be a human being. And that alone is worth something to me. And what you just said is, is, is just touches to me because when you spend an hour with someone and they can be free from being an addict or a bad husband or a terrible coworker or whatever for an hour and they can just be human, that's just, it's extraordinary what that does for people. I mean, it sounds so trivial. It sounds so simple. It sounds like that can't be enough for people. Well, it's enough for people to stop doing drugs for 10 years. It really is for them to be able to be a human when they haven't been able to because of their concepts of who they are. So what you said, Jack, just really hit home for me because it just, I got to experience that firsthand. So it was a beautiful response to Wendy and, and very true. All right, let's get anyone else. If uh, Let's get another question. And thank you, Wendy. That was a great question. And thank you for... Your help. I have one, if I may. Mr. Andrew, go for it. Um, I I just watched the the, the film from the Three Principles Foundation about um, the genesis of of the principles with with Sid, and I wondered, Jack, how how important you felt it was uh, to share Sid's, Sid's experience when you're sharing the principles and working with people. Well, it's a great question. Um, first of all, I didn't see that film. Um, but I had my direct experience with him that um, changed my life. So it's a really interesting and tricky thing. The tricky thing about it is that it makes no sense whatsoever to worship Sid Banks. He was just an ordinary man. He happened to have this amazing experience, this unbelievable experience. Um, could have happened to anybody. Like one minute before it happened to him, you would never have thought that it would have happened to him. You know, so, and that could be any of us. Um, so there's nothing special about Sidney Banks. Now, it just so happens he, to, you know, he was a, a really, a really good guy and a really um, good person to be around. And beyond that, though, he saw something so amazing. I was just thinking about this a couple of days ago. Sid never went through anything that you and I are going through about learning the principles. It all came to him in a flash. And then those of us, and he, all he did, he just started talking about what he saw. The other amazing thing about him is he just wanted to give it away. At first, he refused to take any money for it until he really, you know, got to the point where he needed some money to survive. And, you know, I think of people today who are trying to make a lot of money with this. And it really goes against the, the initial being of service to humankind that Sid originally offered to the world. And that is something to be guided by, I think. For all of us, we could be guided by that. And 
we have since come up with a way that we think helps other people see the, uh, the uh, truth of the three principles and how that makes a difference for people's lives. You know, we've come up with something and that something has evolved over the years and it's not the truth. The only truth is the three principles. How we help people see the truth is totally up for grabs. That's why, as Amir was saying in the first place, now there seem to be so many different directions that people are going in because they see the truth in different ways. But really, it's important to separate the truth of the three principles with how you do it, how you see it, how you experience it. What Sid offered to the world was pure. He saw it. He was just talking about what he saw. And at first, nobody could understand a word he said. That's it. And there's a lesson in that for everybody, too. If we want to be effective with other people, we need to just talk about what we see. As soon as we go beyond what we ourselves see, beyond a shadow of a doubt, all of a sudden we start going into the intellect. And the intellect is not going to make a difference for anybody. So uh, I hope I answered your question somewhere in there because I think I went all over the place. It's a, I think so. It's, it's, it's like sharing what you know beyond a shadow of a doubt with people, and that's the main thing. And, and what, hopefully what you know beyond a shadow of a doubt is basically the essence of the three principles to some degree. Well, however, and, anyone sees it for themselves. Yes. Yeah. However, anyone sees it for themselves, like, you know, we can all do to ask ourselves, what did we actually see that made a difference for us? Why did it make a difference? Like, what were we like? What was our mind like before that? What was our mind? What is our mind like after knowing this? And, and really asking ourselves that because that will help us communicate it to others. But even then, we don't want to just communicate it to others. We want to really be listening to them first to know what to communicate to others. But we yeah. can't go beyond what we know and really have it make a difference for people. Yes. And I, I feel like I'm still wondering, like, how important is it to, to, just, to just share, like, the experience that Sid had, like, you know, before he was just this ordinary guy and a welder and insecure and then the three principles like found him and he had this experience and then all of this happened like is that sort of just miraculous introduction of the three principles into our world via said like is that experience <laughs> important to share in, in, well, in conveying the understanding well the question is why would it be important to share if somebody asked and yeah. many people do then i would share it but to just lay it on people I don't know, because for some people, it, it's just too weird. Yeah. It's just too weird. Yeah, I can see um, that. Some people, you know, like, eat it up with a spoon, you know. Yeah. Uh, but for other people, it's too weird. So if they ask, you know their interest. Okay. Now, the, one last thing I want to say about Sid is, especially his old... Um, tapes, which are not actually supposed to be out there, but I know they are. Um, <laughs> um, to go back to those and just deeply listen to those, that's the purest, I think, that we can get to the essence of what the three principles are all about. And so... I would highly recommend that people 
find as much as they can from Sid directly and listen to him. I'm not saying other things aren't helpful. I mean, I've written a whole bunch of books that have been really helpful for people. And I'm, I'm, you know, really happy about that. But I still think people should also go back to the source. Thank you, Jack. You've answered my question. Okay. Great. You know, Jack, while you were talking, something that, that visually came to me is when we're talking about the offshoots and the, and the purity and what, what, the three principles are it's like what what i'm seeing is like we're buying everyone else's painting and the principles is the paint like when you go back and you say look this is the material that we used to make all those paintings that you're planning on buying the non-duality painting the painting that sounds like oneness the painting that sounds like the single paradigm those are what we can create Yes. With this very thing that we're talking about, the, the three principles, the essence of everything that, that allows for the creation of those other offshoots. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that came to my mind, but that, that's what I heard when you were speaking about. See, there's a lot of spiritual people out there. There's a lot of people who've had these deep spiritual experiences. That's really wonderful. What Sid brought to the world and, and I think what sets him apart is he showed the relationship between the three, universal mind, consciousness, thought. There's a relationship between the three. It's that relationship that gives us our experience of life. People who have spiritual experiences might just see mind or they might just see pure consciousness. The cognitive world or, or, or more, more uh, accurately, like David Bohm from the world of physics talked about thought a lot, the power of thought, but he didn't connect it with consciousness. There are people who talk about consciousness a lot. They don't connect it with thought. The beauty of Sid is that he showed us the connection. And that is what makes it um, tangible for people, for people's everyday lives. Like why we don't have to sit in meditation for years to get a glimpse of enlightenment, you know, we can if we want to, and it's a beautiful thing if people want to, but that's not the answer. The answer is in seeing how, seeing the truth of how it works. Brilliant. Uh, people saying that's a super great point as well. So thank you. Let me see what, where are we at right now with time? We have time for one Last question. This hour has flown by for me, and me too. This is crazy, but uh, I didn't expect anything less. Can I ask hey. a question, Amir? Miss Barbara, absolutely. Thank you. Hi, Jack. Hi, Barbara. I'm wondering, did Sid ever speak to the purpose of all this, the purpose of the human experience? Did he ever speak to that at all? Um, what do you mean by the purpose? Well, I, you know, a lot of people talk about why am I here? I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. Some people are very driven by purpose. So he said that my understanding is he said, okay, I see how this is all working. Mm -hmm. But why? My question yeah, is <laughs> great question. He did speak to that actually when asked. I mean, I happen to be in a, in a group but no, I think he was doing a, um, a lecture or something at the time and somebody asked him that very question. And he said, the purpose of life is to go home. In other words, this is my interpretation of it anyway, we come from the formless energy of all things. We come from formless we come into form our job in form 
is to go back to our connection to the formless and see who we really are and what it's connected to. In, in, a, in a way, it's about, um, oh, I hesitate to say this even. Say I really hesitate to say this, but I'll say it anyway. It's about God knowing itself through the opposite. That's probably a whole other webinar that I would not be qualified to do, but uh, <laughs> um, the form is opposite. It, you know, it, uh, it's not even opposite. It appears that the form is opposite from the formless. It's actually part of the formless, but it's, it's part of the oneness of all things. But being in form, um, we, it, we in the world of form uh, get ourselves into trouble a lot. And when we are able to see through the form, to go back to from whence we came, that's where we get um, automatically cured. And that's what Sid said. If you truly see it, you're cured from whatever happens to you in form because you've stepped out of form back into the formless to truly see. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting a few people that are like, okay, if I'm ever gonna understand this bit, um, it's been interesting. Uh, so some people are probably like Jill said, uh, to awareness. Uh, what, so we'll, we'll leave it. Right. You want to leave it at that or you want to expand on it only because just let me say one thing about okay. it. forget what I just said. <laughs> I knew. Forget what I just said. Just stick with the simplicity. And that's all that counts. Fair enough. Fair enough. We have, are you up for one last question? Are you okay with that? Unless it's a question like that again. No, that is, <laughs> okay. That, so, that was a great question. The problem is with the answer. Yeah. Well, fair enough. You know, she has a question about her taxes. Are you okay with that? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> Hold on one second. Let me get Lenka on the, on the call. Miss Lenka, you're unmuted. Uh, Lenka, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello. There we go. Yeah, hi, thank you, Jack. I mean, yeah, this is just amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My question is, so when I move from, I kind of, to be honest, I haven't read anything about three principles. I came to there because to this group because somebody recommended to, it to me because I've been in this inquiry for a few years. And my inquiry or my question to you, Jack, is it's like when I stop the thought and when I'm just the consciousness or when I just am, I kind of stop doing things and I, I'm not in action about anything. I just, you know, I'm ju I just am. But then I don't produce things in life. I don't create things. I don't, in terms of, you know, business or, you know, I do need to still support myself and make money and create the business and, um, so it's kind of like, how does one, how does one manage to be that just no thought and yet just everything that, that the human world and that the, the world requires us to do, especially I'm, I'm talking about business and the normal day to day, because there's usually a lot of things, but then I just get back into the thought. All right. So, um, are you saying that when you're basking in the realms of pure consciousness um, and, and feeling really connected to the spiritual world, you're not feeling um, motivated to do things in the world of form? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, lucky us, we also have wisdom. Like wisdom is part of... Um, that essence of who we are that, gui that guides us through life. 
And so we are being guided. We are being guided to do what we need to do in this lifetime. That's um, the healthiest thing for us. And that will um, keep us alive through making an income. Like we're being guided and we just have to really listen for that. And, and sometimes we could, ask, if, if we're not getting an answer, we could ask ourselves something like, I'd really like to see what I need to do to take action for myself in the most constructive way that would be most helpful for me and for humanity. And then ask the question, take it off our minds, Go about our business and allow wisdom to work its magic and see what comes to us. And when our mind is relaxed, at some point, we're going to get an answer. So that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure if you can hear me still. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Lenka. Thank you, Lenka. you know, and I, I, I will, I will say, um, Jack, when when you responded, it is is so simple. And when I'm not ready to listen, like for me, I, I'm not speaking for Lenka. I'm speaking for me. It's, it's so hard to hear the simplicity of it until you look back and when things start to settle, you go, damn it, Jack was right again. It's like, it's one of those things that when, when you're in an urgent state or you need an answer right away, a, a simple answer like that tends to, to sometimes get over my head. But I, because I'm, I'm not in that state uh, where, I, I'm, where I'm in a state that I can listen to you, Jack, that was... Uh, that was just confirmation of, of, of the truth of what you said. So thank you. And let me just close off by asking you, Jack, is there, so let me ask you something. Are you, you do all the, the you know, you do a lot of stuff for, for a lot of people, for example, in my group, if people want to do something with you one-on-one -on -one or they want to connect with you, do you, do you take people? Do you do one-on-ones with people? Is it something you, like where are you I at? Do. I do when people find me. Okay. Well, how can they, how can they find you? <laughs> I don't necessarily put myself out there, but um, people can find me by. Um, well, the best way is probably to email me at Jack at Health Realize. That's R E A L I Z E dot com or go to my website, which is www.healthrealize. No, it's actually, no, I think it's, uh, oh, I changed it. It's www.insideoutunderstanding.com um, or find me through Facebook. Yeah, uh, and I'll yeah, put it in the show notes too, Jack. I'll put in your email and your website on the show notes. Uh, and just to let you know, I, I've contacted Jack privately and we've had a couple amazing calls and I'm, on, I'm gonna continue them. There is something about just spending time with him that's, uh, you guys obviously know just from this hour, um, that you get the sense of renewal about life. And, uh, and I'd love to give Jack the credit, but uh, typically it's my own wisdom that did it. But uh, something about having Jack on the call. <laughs> Something about having him on the call that does that does kind of does a super boost. But you guys, I, I I'm I'm uh, pleasantly surprised with so many people that were on the call and the wonderful questions and the deep insights that Jack brought. I can't thank all you guys enough. You guys always step up, get on these calls. It really really means a lot to me, and I'm sure to the speaker that comes. Um, is there any parting words, Jack? You want to say? Is there any last last things? A lot of people are saying their thank yous, but. Is there anything well, I just you want, to want to thank everybody for, for being there and for continuing to look in this direction and for, for just making the world a better place. You know, because of all of your efforts, it, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful thing to see. And I'm just happy to be part of it. 
Jack, you're a big part of it. And like I said, I can't thank you enough. And for everyone that was on here, enjoy your weekend. The weekend's coming up. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And one more thing to say on the air. No, I'm so sorry. Time's up. Okay, <laughs> fine, fine. Go ahead. Oh, so um, the, the dates are not set yet, but at the uh, somewhere in the middle of March, we are going to do a combined, um, like, not a trek, but a, an adventure in Peru. Oh. Combining it with the three principles. So we're going to go to Machu Picchu and see some other Peru ruins at the same time while we're exploring deeper into the three principles. And um, I'm working with somebody in Peru right now that does Peru trips to uh, organize this. So uh, I will, as soon as it gets nailed down, which should be pretty soon, I will send it to you, Amir. Yes, and, and I'll put it up. Absolutely. I will absolutely put it up. And maybe you'd be I'd open. I'd love to see people there. Fair enough. I think that would be great. You, you let me know as soon as that happens. I'm going to put the show notes on the, uh, the video on YouTube. And then uh, would you guys, let me just see by a show of hands, would you guys want uh, Jack uh, on here again? Just anyone here? It looks Don't like. All right. Well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that just means you have to come back if you're open to it. All right. <laughs> thank you so much everyone you guys go get out of here enjoy the rest of your day jack love you from the bottom of my heart thank you so much for doing this and uh we'll see everyone soon thank you very much thanks everybody take care, take care. thanks everyone bye-bye thank you and if you guys while you're on here if you guys can share your insights or anything that you got from the call once i post it i would love that just just to just to keep the ball rolling so thank you so much cool cheers Amir. cheers later michael